I think uh, the talk we have uh, talked about this in the past, yeah. that um, there is something to do with the revision of our national ethos and the collective uh, culture of, of our country, or the subculture we, we have gained where, um, as Eric has said, that as long as you come with big money, splash, good cars, yeah. uh, we glorify sleaze and we glorify that kind of um, life where I, I saw the other day some people in a group I mean uh, sending uh, pictures of uh, somebody with very expensive cars. I think the cars are worth around 30 million. Mm -hmm. So one is called one, number one. The other one is number two. The other one is number three. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you get? Yeah. Now, you... That must be my good friend, Paul. No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the next thing is that you get a debate and people mention and say... Uh, this person was mentioned in uh, in this, this Dubai gold card. Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of uh, life, mm -hmm. celebrating is, things, yeah, celebrating evil, mm -hmm. is not good for the country. Mm -hmm. And what it has triggered, it has triggered a psychosis. What we see, um, the people are captured, and this is why you p you see people even in social media. Because I I look at it. Uh, Whatever I've said here, whatever you are driving at, that's your business. Mm. Eric is in business. I'm also in business because I practice law. Mm. And so I open an office and people come to me. Mm. But one of the things uh, I would want to urge people is that, look, the things you see people display, the outward display of the things they are doing, perhaps in fact displaying wealth, power and money, that is shows a problem. Mm. If that in my it's a psychological yeah, problem. If in that. my experience, mm -hmm. and the, I started practicing law in the 90s, most of the people who've made good money, and I have met clients, people, who, if somebody had an estate worth a billion in 1997, what do you think that person is today? Mm -hmm. But that is a family that spends all their time running away from the media. They don't want any attention. They don't want any publicity mm -hmm. because they are in business. Now, why, what would, why would, if you are okay and you, you eat in a country where we've seen in the reports that only 1% of the population has access to 2.2 million mm -hmm. in the entire country of 48 million, 1% of 48 million, that's 480,000 people, people yeah. you get, can have that kind of money. Why would you want to display opulence? Mm -hmm. There must be a problem you're having. Mm. Either you are dealing with your past, where you had a past which was difficult. Now you need to, to tell people name Lifika. Shafika. Nishafika. Why, why, why do you need to do that? Why do you need to tell us that you built a house and where you built it? That's your private life. Mm. And you're not going to gain anything. Because the other thing I remember Bitok saying, yeah, we also have a, a culture of people wanting to pull you down. down. Yeah. Some people think that they go up by pulling others down. down. And therefore, you have to be very cautious as to what you display in your life. Mm. Because that outward display has a lot of... It, it kind of um, messes people because you, people then give you... You assume something that you are not. Yeah. In fact, you assume... Uh, you, you, you kind of get... Uh, sometimes you, you're driving cars on loan. Mm. So you've assumed a status that you do not have. Yeah. Again, old money is well known. Mm. I mean, uh, if you look at Gong Road, for example, we have a hotel that shares with, with, with a name with with the road. Mm. The hotel has been here for a long time. Mm. We know which family is that, and we know what the the oldest, some of the old people in that family have done. Mm. Okay, some of them have been in parliament. One of them has been in legal practice from the 60s when the lawyers in this country were not even 500. Mm. So you would expect they have <coughs> gathered something. True. So it's not, a, it's not a wada then that you will find that that kind of family that has that, that kind of wealth. Mm. But this new found wealth. Uh, and new and money. No, new money. And you've seen uh, Bitok where people are hoping from one point to another using choppers. Mm. Are you surprised that nowadays uh, the number of uh, choppers flying in the skies uh, putting people here and there ha has gone down? Okay? <laughs> because, uh, you know, questions were be began to rise. And you remember we had also 
uh, a young person who got who went to me, to Meru to get married not only did he fly there he also had uh, a, a convoy mm. of the of the cars the state of the art cars but it subsequently you know that he, his issue became a subject of criminal mm. investigation mm. and this is now where we getting into that that what are the ethos what is is are the things we do is the behavior of our people yeah. uh, does it that that this is symbolize you know that this is who, who we are you know it's like uh, even workers people work even when people are given work to work for for, a, for an organization they are like mercenaries mm. look at the people who are given government jobs what i really sympathized when at one point a president was uh, was forced to have seven of his cabinet secretaries step aside to be investigated by the ESCC and the DCI for corruption mm. you given a public office you given access to facilities for free yeah. a driver a car housing security you you can even uh, get access to the roads you have you, you, you have privilege you know you have preference on the road because you have security but you still still <laughs> really you know you earning 1.5 million shillings whereas in this country even if you earn half that money you are okay you are in the bracket of of, of the high net worth individuals mm. why would you again want to steal okay remember look at the money we we, we had put for the national youth service money f- meant for the youth and the youth is the future of this country yeah. stolen stolen mm. if you are stealing from your if you are killing your son stealing from your son and daughter then you as you say eric those kind of people should be punished yeah. there should be extra punishment mm. because it's like you are destroying your own future. future you know you are destroying your heritage mm. yeah you you don't get a child then you want to kill them to begin yeah. really I, i think there is what is called the debasement of society so sure. we've gotten to that level <coughs> where we need to not just to think about amending constitutions amending uh, laws mm. we also have to amend what is called the cultural substratum mm. of our people so that we start questioning so you are rich you have money how did you get it before we even entertain you mm. please tell us where you got the money from where you got the money you know in normal psychology um there's a psychologist called eric elixson from he was a german and he charted a path uh under development of psychology that a normal human being follows and um somewhere along the line actually you would call it the second last stage of life Uh, the human being is expected to go through a crisis called uh, stagnation versus generativity versus stagnation some difficult words there but what happens basically to put it simply is that the individual begins to feel the need to invest in the coming generation and to make contributions towards that that this individual is no longer putting his life first see a younger person puts their life first but as you mature you begin to want to nurture other people other people and the coming generation and that is where the instinct to be a father the instinct to me to be a mother is going to be highly motivated then the expanded bit of it is that as a man or woman matures even more he is now thinking just beyond his four walls of the house and he's thinking uh, you know even when my daughter or my son grows up they will have to go out there and look for spouses yeah. Yeah. where are those spouses growing up so you you start becoming interested in the bigger neighborhood yeah. because you understand that this bigger neighborhood mm-hmm. is, is, will shape you yeah, is going family, to yes. to shape you is going to affect you yeah. because we advance society through marriages and through relationships yeah, your daughter may end up getting married to to my son or yeah. the other way around so i therefore should have an interest in how your son mm-hmm. is growing up but what we are seeing uh, in africa is a perfect case of abnormal psychology of you know continuous primitive accumulation of wealth you know you want it you want it even when you're older see under normal psychology you will expect that older people will start doing things that distribute wealth if you look at uh, advanced society we talk you're going to see that almost every wealthy person is going to have a foundation almost every wealthy person is going to support a particular foundation or a particular cause somebody may identify a cause on the environment for example 
and say that I am going to donate some of my wealth for support of, of the environment. Some people are going to uh, donate their money to medical causes. Someone yes. is going to say, you know, I have had a problem with my heart. Now that I have all this money in the bank, I want a number of young people to be trained to be cardiologists. We don't see this in Africa. What we see in Africa is that uh, at 99, you're still at the land's offices trying to chase uh, another plot of land, uh, another vehicle, fighting for another position in government or uh, another business deal and that kind of a thing. And it is not necessarily a good thing. I think we need to rehumanize ourselves, and I think we've said this before. We need to start motivating our people in society to think about the greater good of the society and what we can be able to do to create a society that works for everybody. Yeah, That your neighbor affects you tomorrow. Yeah, Because uh, you know, we talk, there's a lot that we can be able to do for our children, those that are, we are bringing up, our biological children. Yes. But when they become adults, there is very little that we can be able to do for them. They will have to go out there and form their own relationships. We should be asking ourselves, who will they form those relationships Relationship with? with? Yeah. And therefore, begin to do things that actually influence the life of every young person mm -hmm. to make them a responsible people in society because you never know that may be your a son-in-law or your daughter-in-law tomorrow. And I think we also need to have that discussion maybe next week on, you know, there seems to be a serious disconnect, a building disconnect on, on families and, and, and class. Yes. And there seems to be a serious class conflict. And I think it's coming from a point whereby we, we take less focus on how we affect our neighborhood. We lock ourselves in our own, yes. in our own bubble of sorts. Mm -hmm. And then you realize that tomorrow you're having children who are growing up and they're getting out of that space that you've built. Yeah. And they are now finding interest in things that you're not giving them. Maybe finding interest in another man who does not come from exactly the, the background that you, this child is yeah. coming from. Yes. And as a parent, you're now beginning to struggle mm. with accepting the other environment coming into mm. you. you yes. know? Then there seems to be some kind of reverse preservation. Mm. Where <laughs> yeah, we talk. Yeah. You know, there was a sad story <laughs> where the, the son of a university professor uh, got involved in a relationship with a daughter, uh, with the daughter of uh, a bank chairman, mm -hmm. and it was in the media, and, and you know it didn't add, add very well. And uh, you know that is the kind of thing that Eric is talking about. That if you think that you're too wealthy, you're too good for this society, mm -hmm. please remember that the next person that. Uh, uh, who is next to you, if you think they are of lower status than you, uh, then you are not concerned about your future mm. or even your safety and security. Mm. Because you now Bitok is raising that point that this this child is bringing new a new environment yeah. into my home. Mm. But I, I won't accept this. I consider, uh, I'm a bank chairman, I consider the, the university professor uh, that, that class, you know, mm. in relation to me, yeah. you know. Um, uh, you know, we've seen these things and they are painful. They are very painful to them, uh, to, to the families. But I want to say one thing. Uh, we celebrated, or people celebrated um, the life of uh, the late Mzee Nyachai. Okay? Mm. He had many children, mm. uh, 37 of them. His biological children. Mm -hmm. But if you remember the Minister for Interior, the uh, Honorable uh, Matiangi saying, that for all intents and purposes, the only relationship I did not have with Mzenya Chai was the fact that we were not biologically related, but mm. he's his son. Mm. You, you get the point? Yeah. And not only him. You, you, if you remember, there are many other sons of that region who've said that this was our father. Yeah. Now, what, what do you mean by he... What do they mean by he was their father? Yeah. Is because he spotted people who had talent, nurtured them, and they've risen. Mm. We can't mention, I, I could mention many because I know quite a number yeah. from that region who mm. owe who they are and what they are in society to him, mm. to that man. Mm. Now, you can see his own children are rising to the top. Mm. But I want to come back to a region where we come from, you and I, Eric. Mm. And we know we have a lot of mega billionaires from mm. there. Yeah. And um, some of them, you know, have even had uh, to say they want private barriers. Mm. You, you get? Yeah. 
Yeah, we, we've seen families in central Kenya uh, be talk very sadly, mm. where people want to have a private burial mm. ceremony. Mm. They don't want anything to do with the public. Mm. Now, I know one of those families, and I asked them that, look, you come from an area that is crime prone. Mm. There's a lot of criminal activity there, here. And so your houses are all have, uh, they have electric fences, they have razor wire, like a fortress. It's a, fa- it's a fortress. Mm-hmm. You are like in a prison. Yeah. Simply because you are their own grandfather used to be some chairman of a district African court. You know, during the colonial days, mm. those are the people who gathered a lot of land and resources. But that man would not want to have to help anybody around him. Mm. So in <coughs> essence, then what happened at the end of the day is that you have a situation where his family is okay but everybody else around them is not okay. Mm. And therefore, a lot of people no, no longer see, they see them as the object of hate. Mm. They no longer see your family as an epitome of success. True. You are reduced to an object of hate mm. and an object of defranchisement mm. and, and denial. You know, people, people now begin to see that we don't have because you have. You have yeah. you know? And in a perfect, if you go to class wars, you can imagine what would ha- happen to that family. Yeah. They would lose everything they own mm. in their rural place. Mm. And this is the situation we must ask ourselves. And that wha- what, what is a contribu- your contribution? Your contribution is not amassing all manner of wealth. Mm. You know? What is this that, you, what is the heritage? What is this that you will live? You know? Uh, when you are not there, what will people say about you? So. Will, they, will they talk about how you, you looked after orphans, you picked people who could not pay you back? Mm. Because most of the people that um, were helped by some of the people who who gained prominence in this country, they couldn't pay back. True. And uh, But we've got a, a society where I would rather uh, be flying around in choppers, you know, to laugh at... Um, people who cannot even afford a single meal in mm. a day. Mm. It's a very bad uh, situation. True. Yeah. I think that's another discussion we need to have because there seems to be a serious struggle in that area, you know, uh, religion with association and transition of families. Anyway, so we have looked at the issues that are affecting psychological issues. What are the issues that are affecting psychological issues? Juzi, the president has been appointed and uh, as a chairman. Of this and that, and people have been celebrating the president. I don't know what that means for this country, uh, one day. Yeah, first, it's, it's a good thing for the country, mm-hmm. and uh, sometimes uh, I, I see I see uh, a lot of our young people, uh, some because of lack of information, mm-hmm. uh, saying all the manner of bad things and uh, thinking that um, you be, you are saying very good things uh, for the head of state. Uh, I mean. In in the management in political <coughs> governance, there is something we call acts of government mm. and acts of state. Mm. Uh, international relations are not acts of government; mm. they are acts of state. Now, the East African Community is a regional bloc, and this regional bloc, the membership is not individuals. It's not you and I. Uh, it's not uh, Bitok, you and I, Eric. Mm. No, it is this, it is the countries that are member states. The, the word is member? Member S- states. Member states. So it means by the appointment by the rest of the states, the head of, the head of states, giving, a, according our president, that, um, that privilege, the privilege is given, is bestowed, not in, on, in uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, in personam, mm. but in him as the head of state. Yeah. of the Republic of Kenya. Yeah. So that office comes to us as a privilege to us as a country. The only thing is that the president is the embodiment of our country, is, 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 is the embodiment of our national unity. So therefore, uh, you will get some people saying, Iyo it's, it's lack of understanding. Mm. And even those who now think that he's been appointed, it's a competition with, uh, with uh, his supposed uh, enemies. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's again foolishness. Yeah. This is an act of state. Mm. Now, if he is given this position for three years, we know his term expires in August next year. Mm. So the next head of state in Kenya will continue you know, to, to, be, to chair the East African mm. community, which is a good thing because it portends for many other things. We are talking about trade. We did not form the East African community for purposes of... Uh, it has several milestones. Mm. 
First, we achieved the customs union in 2005. Customs union means that we now have a single law, the East African Community uh, Customs, the East African Community Customs Management Act. Mm -hmm. And because of that act, then the countries adopt a common external tariff. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you come, when goods are imported into East Africa yeah. from other countries, if, for example, we say we are going to levy 25% on all goods imported outside the region, the 25% will apply across all the East African mm. countries. Mm. And if it is 25% in value on the dollar or the yen, it's going to apply to all goods which are imported beyond those countries. Now, uh, that becomes important because... When you talk about uh, import business and export, mm. you're talking uh, now of a regional block, block of a population of about 170 mm. million. So you're looking at a bigger market. The second milestone we were supposed to achieve uh, from 2005, 2004, 2004, 2005, when the, the, the common, uh, the customs union was a protocol was adopted, up to 2010, we would say there has been full implementation. Mm. The challenge has been what we call now the um, common market uh, protocol because the common market protocol was supposed to run starting from 2010 where we are supposed to have free movement of people goods labor capital and services mm. in the region mm. but we know that has not happened yeah. why is it important for kenya uh, and why why does this position then bestow upon kenya should be proud of it remember uh, we had an incident where one of the largest, or in the largest company in East Africa, the most profitable company mm. in, the, in the region, mm. which is Safaricom, Safaricom, wanted to send a Kenyan CEO to Tanzania. Yeah. They were given a class B uh, permit, uh, entry permit to that country, <laughs> but they were denied a work permit. permit. You see now, that defeats the very essence of the 2010 common market yeah. protocol. protocol. Okay. And th now, you need to understand that it is basic, uh, it's, it's common sense, yeah. Eric. Mm. You, you are creating Maridad Motors. Yeah. Do you want to people to work, do you want another person to decide for you who works for Maridad? No. You'd and this is where position. Kenyans then should be happy that the president being in charge, and not, not just the president, the CEO, or what we call them, the chairman of the of the community, the council, uh, the community is Dr. Mathuki, a mm. Kenyan. Mm. So Kenya has a good opportunity now to drive the, the agenda yeah. in the community, being the largest economy too in terms of size, in terms of the of the GDP purchasing power parity and nominal. Okay, we are the largest in the region, mm. so we have a perfect opportunity to move these things. Uh, you currently only Rwanda is allowing the free movement of uh, of people labor, mm. capital, goods and services. Yeah. In other words, if you go to, to Rwanda today, if you fly in, you don't need to, to, to have your Kenyan passport. Yeah. You only need your ID. Mm. And by identification alone, it takes two days in Rwanda to get a business registered, mm. to get uh, a license to work, and to, to have business. You see, you see how, how, how fast they've gone? Yeah. And this is why they are growing very fast, even mm. being a small economy, because they are able to attract the best of the best. Mm. Kenya is lucky in terms of our education institutions. We're producing very good people. But you can see if we have, if countries engage in what you call non-trade uh, non barriers mm. to block other people from their countries, then it becomes very difficult for us to move. And this population of our young people who are agitating, they have no jobs, they have no access to business opportunities. The East African community, if it opened up, True. we really give us an opportunity. And I want to say this because I have a relative, um, Bitok, who works in Kigali, Rwanda. And uh, he's been able to, he's actually married there. You know, he's been able to set up base in that country. Mm. Okay? And he's also investing back here. I have others, uh, Kenyan teachers, many of them who are teaching in, in Kigali. Mm. The only difference is that some of our people don't understand. In Kenya, we have a lot of freedom. Sometimes we use it recklessly, mm. even to engage in unnecessary agitation. You've got to respect that society. Mm. They're not used to that. The, this thing of uh, anybody can go to social media in Kenya and insult the president, insult mm. who? Mm. Uh, th th that kind will be frowned upon. Mm. In, in some of the countries in East Africa. Mm. I've been fortunate um, to travel around East Africa. 
uh, I chaired um, a, a, a task force for the East African Revenue Authorities for uh, for a period of three years. So I was able to go to Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda many times, Tanzania, representing the Republic of Kenya. And I know the opportunities that abound in the region. In the region. Mm. Another challenge I want to challenge the young people, nowadays you don't need to move to go and work for people in Burundi. Sure. I was impressed when uh, in, in Bujubura when I was in a hotel there to know that two other Kenyans were in the same hotel and they had come there only for three days to implement an, ap- an application, mm. a digital application, mm. which they had developed in Kenya, yeah. but people in Burundi then had purchased it wow. for yeah. their business. Mm. You would be surprised that uh, as, as late as 2019, uh, Uber and the other uh, digital uh, uh, digital cab apps, mm. they, uh, they were yet to enter. Early 2019, they were yet to enter Burundi. Burundi. But uh, we need to encourage our young people to also spot those opportunities, you yeah. know, and create liaisons beyond Nairobi. If you are always talking about, if you are going to social media to always post about your your ward, not even your county, mm. your ward mm. constituency. You know, your county, that's the farthest you can get. Then yeah. you're not helping yourself. Yeah. Neither are you useful to Kenya. Mm. You must look at what lies Yoda. What does South Sudan need? Yeah. What does Burundi need mm. from Kenya? And finally, let me say this, that Kenya is very lucky. Kenya is a frontier, is a frontier country in the region. By a frontier country means we have access to sea. So in other words, we can engage yeah, we have capacity to engage in, the, in operations to do with maritime operations, mm. that's shipping. We have uh, the road transport. We also have rail and air. Yeah. In other words, we are not limited to, to uh, a country that is landlocked. is only limited to air, land and mm. uh, air uh, uh, and road. Mm. Okay? They don't have maritime yeah. unle- unless they have a lake like, for example, Uganda. Uganda. But we are very lucky. In other words, we are an import corridor mm. in, into the hinterland. Mm. And that creates, creates a very big, significant line of business in logistics. Mm. That's where you come in. You're mm. providing tools for yeah, logistics for business. Logistics, yeah. for bu- business. Mm. But how many of our young people with university degrees are getting into this? Uh, you will understand, Bitoka, I keep saying I learn these things. Mm. I know them because that's my business. Mm. I'm in the knowledge economy. Mm. I have friends who are in Kigali, mm. in Bujubura. When they ask a question, I will charge you the, the, the $100. That's 10000 So that I give you the, no. the answers, no. the knowledge. Mm. And that is what then our, we challenge our young people to do. That this transit corridor of goods leaving the port of Mombasa, the port of Lamu very soon, going into southern Ethiopia, southern Sudan. What are our young people thinking about that corridor? True. Okay? Mm. Are they only thinking about who will be elected MCA in their village, <laughs> how they can get a job? <clears throat> in, are they focusing on that? And how they can now, themselves on that. Goods. Corridor. Because you import goods. Mm. And this, is, this is the last point I want to mention about this. When you import goods, you sure, what is the thing that assures you that your goods will arrive in Kenya? Because you a dealer in that uh, that side, isn't sure. it? You've paid your money. Yeah. The goods have been shipped. Mm. But there is assurance, and you've seen Japan as a country punishing individuals who commit fraud because mm. they know Africa is a large market for their second hand cars. Yeah. And therefore, if you destroy that market, the state suffers. Would you think the state will allow that? No. Mm. Goods in this country, we've got, got a lot of pilferage along the corridors. Mm. Because we've got transit goods moving from Kenya all the way to South Sudan, mm. sometimes to Central Africa Republic through Uganda and South Sudan. Mm. Then what are our Kenyan youth doing in terms of dig, uh, developing digital apps for transit good uh, management? Mm. Okay, a very good, a very good thing. You know, so that we th- there is management of transit goods and assurance for a person importing from Central Africa Republic that if the goods come through Kenya, I will get them. They are tracking apps. They are tracking apps. apps. Mm. And that there is limitless opportunities in that area. Sometimes I wish I could go back to school and study (laughs) 
and learn this thing. You know, the best thing about yeah. it is you can learn anything even at your yes. age now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I would like you to weigh in as well, Eric. And uh, now I would like us to look again at the, uh, you know, at the elusive unity of EAC. Mm. For the longest time, we've been struggling to put up together the East African community. Yeah. Even as we talk about the president being elected a chair, I mean, is it as amorphous as it feels because you don't feel the impact of that? You know, you're talking right now, there seems to be a conflict between Burundi and Rwanda. There is an on and off relationship between uh, Kenya and Tanzania. That yeah. day, Tanzania, Walichoma, Kukuzetu, <laughs> or Kenchik. Again, uh, they've, been, uh, they've been also throwing jibes at us. I told the other day, the Bunge at Tanzania, mm. they were saying there's some country which imported uh, uh, praying mantis from China. <laughs> 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 That is the SDR. These guys, but I keep, uh, they always no, have not a very kind words to say about us. Mm. So there seems to be a serious uh, breakdown in terms of relationship between Kenya and Tanzania. Uganda seems to also to be, uh, it's very polygamous. On this hand, it has Tanzania, it keeps tickling Tanzania, and also tickling Kenya. Mm. You remember you're supposed to have that line that's supposed to run from Kenya. Uh, actually, the SDR, she was supposed to run into Uganda. Mm. But then again, they've got another deal from Tanzania. And now, uh, there's a railway line that's being considered running from Darport through Uganda into Rwanda. So okay, Kenya seems to be ally, you know to be uh, to be alienated from the ESC community for one reason or the other. And then again we have the issue of our uh, governance pride. Kenya seems not to care really much about this diplomatic uh, diplomatic strategy. When you look at what happened in Tanzania when the president was being sworn in, we sent in an ambassador for a national function. Mm. So there seems to be a serious disconnect between these communities, th this country. For next time that having a functional ESC is almost at nil. Even as we just talk about the ESC community, we talk about the corridor that was good friend is telling us about. There seems to be a serious mismatch in terms of implementing uh, protocols that they agree on. I mean, what does it mean? What does this mean for the ESC and for the country? You know, Bitoka, I think it points back to something that we had mentioned sometimes back that uh, in Africa, I think we are good in working against each other and competing with each other than we are in working together. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when you talk about uh, economies of skill, there is economies of skill that individuals can be able to engage in to make their lives easier. Then also there are economies of skill that governments can be able to engage in to make their things easier. I would, for example, want us to look at the problem of health in Africa and uh, how much money we spend in, for example, India going to uh, t to treat our loved ones there you know justifiably and understandably because you know healthcare seems to be cheaper there even after you factor in their affairs and all that and the question you would ask yourself is would it not make sense for example for the east african community to together yeah invest in healthcare even if we will end up with one big facility that everybody in east africa knows that if, even if you have uh, this condition, there is an institution within East Africa that can be able to treat you. Is it that the government cannot come together to build the infrastructure, to hire the doctors that we need if we do not have them from the country? And by the way, we have very qualified uh, uh, medical personnel in the country if given the right support. But you will find that I think at the end of the day, the same behavior that we see in the villages is the same behavior that we see at the international level. That at the end of the day, when we sit down as Kenyans and as Tanzanians sit down, as uh, Ugandans, Burundians, Rwadis sit down and the people in South Sudan, we are not thinking of how we can be able to unify ourselves and come up with a better society for ourselves. Because where did the boundaries come from anyway? You know, when, when you cross from, from Kenya to Tanzania, it looks like a joke. You, you, still look at like, home. Hey, you feel like you're still at home. The guys on the other side speak your language. They look like you. But someone has all of a sudden told you, now you are in a totally different country. You have to queue. You need probably a visa and all that. You know, we need to ask ourselves, are, are these restrictions really necessary? Yeah? That for you to, to take your family uh, on, on, on a holiday across the other country, it looks like it is such a big thing. And you're just a few hundreds of kilometers away. I think it is something that the policymakers need to, to carefully look okay. at. Mm -hmm. Because uh, like Captain says, if we open up the minds of our young people to understand that the market is bigger than Kenya, the young person in Burundi will understand the market is bigger than Burundi. Yeah, Just right now, there's a course I'm doing uh, at, at Strathmore on business management. And I'm very happy to note that most of the students in that course are, are coming from the East African community. Some of them joining us uh, through online platforms. And that is on, on the education sector. How much more synergy 
can we be able to create through trade can we be able to create through uh, healthcare can we be able to create through education if we actually came to work together right. yeah uh, wonder there seems to be it looks like kenya is still stuck in that uh, big brother syndrome within the esc and it's not realizing that its compatriots are coming up very quickly and almost overtaking when you look at the growth of of tanzanian uh, economy it has been rather the most growing yes. within africa actually yes, yes. and uh, before we know it there is a bigger chance that these guys might overtake us and kenya clearly as much as they still in stuck in that big brother syndrome has not been playing the big brother role what can kenya do what is the responsibility of kenya in fostering uh, you know trade unity among the esc because it's biggest beneficiary yes, yes. since you mentioned that we are a frontier country we 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 deserve to gain more from a united esc than any other country within what roles can kenya play 